performance of the set. Okay, so my name is Roy Wolf, and I'm a sophomore here at uh, PVI, and I did my DIS uh, studies on the sacred music of the Catholic Church. So here's a little overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, first of all, we're going to see the distinction between the sacred versus the profane, or what we would say the secular. Next, we're going to talk about the different types of sacred music, that is Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. Then we're going to move ahead and we're going to talk about uh, the Second Vatican Council and its aftermath and traditional Catholic music today. And this uh, image here, this is Solem Abbey. It's in France. It's a very important center for Gregorian chant uh, for its revitalization and continuation. So first of all, let's talk about the idea of the sacred versus the profane. So Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony, we call them sacred music. And these are in contrast to profane, uh, we would say secular music. So the contrast of the sacred versus the profane, it is not what is good versus bad, popular versus unpopular, entertaining versus boring, what I like or what I do not like. Sacred music is rather set apart for prayer in church. And sacred music was never like popular music, and sacred music was never for entertainment. Rather, it's set apart, like everything's, you know, the, we, in the Mass, we have the sacred vestments that are specifically set apart for worship of God. Again, sacred music is set apart for the liturgy. So to illustrate this point, uh, just recently for World Youth Day, uh, Father Guillermo Pichotto, uh, he was called the DJ priest, uh, who reporters said, revolutionized World Youth Day by playing an electronic music version of Alleluia. Now this music arguably is not sacred, but the important thing here is that he played it before Pope Francis' last Mass, so not during the Mass itself, so not, not liturgical. So uh, let's now talk about the first kind of sacred music in the church, that is Gregorian chant. So Gregorian chant is the sung liturgical prayer of the Catholic Church. It's also called plain chant or plain song because it's meant to be sung unaccompanied and unharmonized. And it's, it's quite simple, really. It consists of just two elements. First, you have the words, and these are usually taken directly from sacred scripture. And then we have, of course, the melody. Now, of these two elements, the words are the most critical. And the melody, we see, it serves only to elevate the spiritual meaning of the text. So first, let's talk about the first of these two elements, the words. So we can see that words have existed forever. In Genesis, we read how God spoke everything into existence. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the Gospel of John, uh, in John chapter 1, it opens with, in the beginning was the Word. In Greek, it's, it's uh, logos. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the original Greek, logos it means not only word, but also reason, as in the word logical that we get uh, today in English. So we understand that words, too, they're also thoughts. Uh, the noted linguist, Noam Chomsky, has argued, quote, the modern conception that communication is the function of language probably derives from the belief that language somehow must have evolved from animal communication, though the available evidence is strongly against it. Whatever the reason, the evidence appears to favor a more traditional view that language is fundamentally a system of thought. And we see also language and consciousness go hand in hand. Uh, you know, besides speech, uh, there are, quote, as far as we know, not any other activities that we can perform both internally and externally. You know, we can talk, but also we think in language. So the, we understand this is, this is beautiful, the, the logos, the reason, the word of the omnipotent God has existed for all eternity. So now let's talk about melody. So singing in praise of God creates humanity. Uh, now in the book of Job, it describes how God created the universe and says, while the morning stars sang together. Now, perhaps this is a poetic metaphor, but fascinating new research by NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program actually has shown that the vibrations within stars actually do produce sound waves. And science reporter Elizabeth Landau writes, we can't hear it with our ears. But the stars in the sky are performing a concert, one that never stops. Angels, they're often described as singing in the glory of God. In the book of Revelation, uh, we read how the cherubim proclaim before the throne of God, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. 
And this canticle is sung for all eternity by the angelic host, and humanity echoes it with the Sanctus, or the Holy, 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 and the Holy Mass. Uh, so, we see uh, music has also existed always in religious practice. Uh, Ian McGillicrest, he's this researcher and he studies the neurological aspects of religion. He states, quote, the principal way in which humanity has felt compelled to, both to express a sense of and to make contact with the divine is through music. And in this it seems to me that it has succeeded so immediately and so indubitably that language is scarcely needed. However, because worship could be done possibly with music alone and without words, there is a danger that using a melody could overshadow the words. And so here we see uh, an ancient mosaic. This is an ancient Greek uh, hydrolis. It's the water organ. This, this, that actually was the, uh, this is the ancestor of the modern day pipe organ, which actually, uh, before, it, it was only introduced into the Catholic Church at around the 9th century. Before that, it was totally uh, sung unaccompanied and harmonized. And we also see the uh, cornu, which is a type of horn. Uh, singing has, um, has traditionally not been accompanied in the uh, Eastern Orthodox rites. They've never permitted musical instruments in any kind of worship, uh, not even the pipe organ. And uh, all music is often sung a cappella, that is in Italian, a cappella means uh, without accompaniment in the style of the chapel. So also singing, uh, see of course, singing, instrumental music, and dance are all part of pagan religion. In fact, music actually means from the muses. So here's an ancient picture of Euterpe, the muse of music, uh, holding a double flute. It's kind of uh, you know, these two, two sides that you can play two different melodies. And there's another painting here uh, of pagan dancers and uh, musicians worshiping Bacchus. So I would suggest if, if you ever go into a, a house of worship and you hear something like this, So you, you should probably leave, because they, they might be worshiping Bacchus, so, so uh, it's gotta get out of there. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the origins of Gregorian chant. Now this is fascinating. So Gregorian chant origins go way back, all the way back to King David. So uh, we read in the book of Samuel and Psalms how uh, King David played the harp, he sang, he composed music, and we still have the lyrics of that music with us in the Psalms. Uh, now, crucially, chant was used in ancient Judaism. Uh, the Jewish practice of the cantillation, that is, the chanting of scripture, began at least a thousand years before Christ. And as a rabbi, Jesus was certainly familiar with cantillation, and it would stand a reason that he would have often sung scripture in the synagogue. And indeed, some Gregorian chant melodies are actually very similar to Hebrew synagogue chant. They're based off of it, such as the Tonus Peregrinus, uh, the uh, ancient gospel tone, and the preface tone. And I, I uh, say a lot of research uh, from Mr. Kwasniewski, and I actually got the chance to attend one of his talks in the area. He was giving a talk, and he autographed his book for me, uh, which is Good Music, Sacred Music, and Silence. It's a fascinating read. So uh, musicologist uh, Charles McGuire uh, notes that among the practical reasons for chanting instead of just speaking scripture was that uh, until the 20th century, microphones did not exist. So the only way you could proclaim a text to a large audience was to chant it, therefore slowing down the rate of speech and projecting the voice. So it was almost like, it was almost like speaking, but setting a tone to it. And uh, we actually, have a reason from the Bible to sing in this chant way at Mass. Uh, because after the Last Supper, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and in, and in other Gospels, uh, we, all, we read that then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This, this happens just after the first Mass. Uh, this is the, the Last Supper. And uh, plausibly, uh, Jesus and his disciples would have sung one of the Psalms of David. And this is actually uh, what a lot of the Gregorian chant is based on. And, uh, in the, and elsewhere in the Bible, we are encouraged to sing in praise of God. Uh, in James, we read, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. In Acts, uh, we read, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Later, St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, he encourages Christians to, quote, Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and playing to the Lord in your hearts.
He also states in his letter to the Colossians, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing, uh, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with gratitude to your hearts to God. So now let's, let's talk about other musical instruments, what, uh, or about using musical instruments in Mass. And uh, of course, I, I love to play musical instruments, uh, but, let, but uh, the old historian of the church, Eusebius of Caesarea, he writes, of old, at the time of those of the circumcisions, in other words, the ancient Jews, were worshiping with symbols and types. It was not inappropriate to send up hymns to God with the Psalterian and the Scythera, and to do this on Sabbath days. And then these are pictures of the ancient Israeli uh, Psalterian and Scythera. And Scythera is actually where we get the word, uh, the word for the musical instrument, zither. So we render our hymn, so he goes on to say, we render our hymn with a living Psalterian and a living Scythera, and with spiritual songs. The unison voices of Christians would be more acceptable to God than any musical instrument. Accordingly, in all the churches of God, united in soul and attitude, with one mind, and an agreement of faith and piety, we send up a unison melody in the words of the Psalms. Uh, many other uh, early Christians go on to emphasize this point. St. John Chrysostom says, David firmly sang songs. Also today we sing hymns. He had a lyre with lifeless strings. The church has a lyre with living strings. Our tongues are the strings of the lyre with a different tone indeed, but much more in accordance with piety. Here there is no need for the cithara, or for stretch strings, or for the plectrum, or for art, or for any instrument. But, if you like, you may yourself become a cithara, mortifying the members of the flesh, and making a full harmony of mind and body. Uh, other Catholic Christians who predominantly discourage the use of musical instruments of worship include Clement of Alexandria, St. Thomas Aquinas, Erasmus of Rotterdam, and Augustine of Hippo wrote, Let none turn his heart to instruments of the theater. <laughs> So now, uh, Gregorian chant, as Kwartneski indicates, chant de developed prodigiously in the first Christian millennium. By the time we reach Pope St. Gregory the Great, a body of chant already existed for the sacrifice of the Mass and the daily round of prayer, the divine office, or what is called today the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, St. Gregory, he organized this musical repertoire, and as a result, the chant ever afterwards has been honored with his name, Gregorian. Now, though tra uh, traditionally attributed to St. Gregory, uh, scholars today argue that the most substantial standardization of chant repertoire actually occurred two centuries later. And uh, this was during a period known as the Carolingian Renaissance during the reign of, the, of King Charlemagne. Uh, as Kardinevsky explains, at this point, not only psalms and antiphonals began to be sung, but indeed virtually anything meant to be proclaimed out loud. And he also summarizes the early development of chant, saying, quote, the core of Gregorian chant repertoire dates from before the year 800, but the bulk of it was completed by the year 1200. So now enough talk, just talk about Gregorian chant, let's take a listen to an example. So uh, if uh, some of the, members, the gentlemen of my school would come up and we shall demonstrate. This is, uh, this is the introit or en entrance antiphon for the Feast of Corpus Christi. And you'll notice it's a slightly different, a very different notation, but this is actually where our modern musical notation comes from. Here, there's no uh, time signature, so it's very, very free music, and it's, it's supposed to transmit the words of scripture. Now, if, if we were actually doing this in church, we'd, we'd probably be you know, at the back in the choir loft, so there, would, there wouldn't be you know, any applause, but this is, we're, it's, uh, it's enhanced prayer, uh, sending the words of scripture. You'll see in the middle here, we go into a song. We're going to elevate the words of the song. So.
et filio et spiritui santo si that we talked about earlier between the sacred and the profane, that is the secular, to include music that's used in the liturgy. Now during the 1500s, Martin Luther created what became known as chorales, and now these were religious hymns based on secular tunes such as popular tavern songs. Now these, this, is a very, uh, this was a very, very common practice. Uh, it's, you can see it all, all throughout music history. Uh, for example, the tune of our national anthem is actually set to the tune of an old uh, tavern song known as To an Actor on in Heaven. So it just, that just goes to show how, how widespread this practice was. But uh, in the 1500s, this practice also began to influence Catholic sacred music, in other words, used in the liturgy. Uh, so, uh, according to Ronald Prowse, the Council of Trent in the 1500s, identified several abuses in the church pertaining to sacred music, including the infiltration of popular songs and dances. Now, the Council of Trent reaffirmed the place of Gregorian chant in the liturgy and discouraged use of liturgical music based upon secular tunes. Then later, at the end of the 19th century, composers began to set religious texts to the popular operatic style of the day, uh, such as Schubert's beautiful operatic style, aria saying of Ave Maria. So yeah, it's, you know these are very familiar. They're they're beautiful music, but again, it's it's this distinction between the sacred and the secular, the profane. So, but uh, Pope Pius X he released a encyclical known as Trale Solutitudini, and in that he reaffirmed the primacy of chant, though he allowed for some modern compositions to be used provided they were, quote, free from reminiscences of motifs adopted in the theaters and not be fashioned even their external forms after the manner of profane, that is, secular pieces. Pius X promoted the publication of Liber Usalis and other references, which revitalized the Gregorian chant in the Roman liturgy. And these are the standard books of chant uh, that, that govern uh, the church year, what is sung. So now, let's talk about sacred polyphony. This is a direct uh, offshoot of chant. It's a development of chant. So we see how, alongside chant, sacred polyphony eventually emerged during the late medieval period and the Renaissance. Um, McGuire explains, polyphony is a way to describe a uh, musical composition that includes one, more than one part sounding simultaneously. At first, it was an improvised practice discussed in numerous books on music. By the 12th century, we see examples of polyphony notated in several traditions. Uh, polyphony initially arose as a way of decorating a chant. In polyphony, the plain song melody of a chant was left intact, and this was called the cantus firmus. The composer then added a musical gloss that was sung simultaneously. These musical glosses became uh, more common and ever more elaborate, creating the first polyphony. Now, the development of polyphony initially was limited because there was no way to write music down. Uh, the early 7th century musical scholar Isidore Seville had lamented this by saying, quote, unless the sounds are held by the memory of man, they perish because they cannot be written down. Now finally, music began to be written down with something called pneumatic notation. And in this system, with these different shaped lines and dots, kind of like little squiggles on a page, they're like a little reminder of the general contour of the music. But these couldn't be sung by someone who did not already know the melody. So finally, uh, this uh, Benedictine monk, Guido of Arezzo, uh, he was a music theorist, and he invented what uh, finally would become music, uh, modern music notation. And um, Guarda indicates that polyphony seems to have risen around the same time uh, as the beginning of modern musical notation. So McGuire discusses how the most prominent earlier tradition 
of polyphony. It was called Notre Dame polyphony, or polyphonic organum. And now this emerged uh, in the uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, France, in the 12th and 13th centuries. And the two names that are most associated with this music were two priests. Their names were Leona and Periton. Uh, now the golden age of polyphony has to be the Renaissance. Uh, the great patrons of the arts, they are among the nobility and the clergy, uh, they would employ musicians to write music, and this gave rise to the idea of the composer as an occupation. And now previously, music had written, uh, been written largely anonymously, and this goes to show how uh, music was totally separated from you know, performance, especially in church. So uh, Guillaume Dufay, uh, he is one of my uh, favorite composers of polyphony. He is uh, from the Franco-Flemish school of polyphony. He's considered uh, among the first generation of European musicians considered composers by occupation. And many of these composers were priests because they were among the most well-educated in Europe at the time. So now, let us listen to an example of sacred polyphony. Uh, so if, if my choir can come up on stage. And this is a setting of the Agnus Day. You may recognize the text as uh, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, where we say in Mass. And this is based upon work by Philippe Berthold. And I hope you enjoy it. So as you notice, I'm going to start with singing the Cantus Firmus. There was the plain chant melody, and then it will break into four-part flip. On whose day we call this peccata mundi misere So polyphony too, uh, over time, uh, you know, as we talked about Gregorian chant, uh, needed to be saved. Polyphony too, over time, uh, various these various Catholic composers of polyphony began to base works of polyphony on popular or profane melodies. In addition, Ronald Krauss explains how the development of more and more complex systems of polyphonic counterpoint made it ever more difficult to discern the words presented in music. You remember that the words are the most important part. So the Council of Trent it addressed these abuses of sacred music. And according to Barbara Hannon, Hanning, the Council of Trent ensured that the words of the liturgy were clear and the music was reverent in tone. Now the most famous name in Renaissance polyphony has to be that of Giovanni per Luigi da Palestrina. Now Palestrina, he became the leading composer of the late 16th century. And uh, part of his success lies in his orderly presentation of the words in polyphony so that the text of sacred scripture was not lost among the complex rhythm, chord progression, and ornamentation. Uh, now, Grove, Grove Music Online states that Palestrina's success earned him an enduring reputation as the ideal Catholic composer. And there's actually, uh, the story goes that it was, it was uh, Palestrina's work that actually saved Renaissance polyphony. The council was going to ban Renaissance polyphony, but they heard uh, the, the council got, a, uh, got to hear one of uh, his works, and they said this, this, this must be preserved. So. And then again, later, uh, Pope Pius X, he called in his encyclical Trilite Solutitudini, he called not only for the restoration of chant, but he also promoted polyphony. He wrote, quote, 
Classic polyphony agrees admirably with Gregorian chant, the supreme model of all sacred music, and hence it has been found worthy of a place side by side with Gregorian chant. This too must therefore be restored largely in ecclesiastical functions. Okay, so now let's move ahead to the Second Vatican Council. And so despite the long musical tradition of Catholic sacred music, a faithful Catholic can now attend Mass every Sunday on our Holy Days and perhaps never hear chant or polyphony in a liturgical setting. Now, is this because the Second Vatican Council did away with these forms of traditional sacred music? And the answer is no, it did not. <laughs> the Second Vatican Council, uh, it's regarded as making great changes in the form of Catholic worship, but the Council documents reaffirm the importance of Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. In uh, the Constitution on the Divine Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, we hear, the Church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specially suited to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services. But other kinds of sacred music, especially polyphony, are by no means excluded from liturgical celebrations. So since, since we are at PVI, uh, let me just leave you in St. Paul VI, pray for us. <laughs> But to see what happened with sacred music lies in these lines here. But other kinds of sacred music, especially sacred polyphony, are by no means excluded. So the, the, the big risk is what a lot, a lot of people saw. So there was a kind of attitude of experiment, experimentation in sacred music. So what, to see what happened, we can look at these two composers of the conciliar period. Uh, this is Dennis Fitzpatrick and Ray Rep. Now, during this time, they both, they both came out with albums. Uh, Dennis Fitzpatrick came out with Demonstration English Mass, and Ray Ruff came out with the Mass for Young Americans. So Dennis Fitzpatrick, he's still alive. Uh, he was a brilliant musical composition major in 1955 at Chicago's DePaul University. And uh, Fitzpatrick and his associates, they began to introduce chants in English into the Latin low mass at Sacred Heart Parish in Chicago. Uh, the Latin low mass is the form of the old, the traditional liturgy uh, of, that, is sung, that is done without music. Uh, the high mass is where chant and polyphony is sung. He also joined the, uh, the group called the Friends of the English Liturgy, who advocated for the mass to be translated into English. And uh, Fitzpatrick composed Demonstration English Mass as a complete English chant setting of the mass and recorded it in 1963 with the Friends of the English Liturgy as a long play record album. And the, organi or the organization gave this record and an accompanying altar missal to all the 500 English-speaking bishops attending Vatican II. And this album had some popularity. You can still find it around. Demonstration English Mass. And what's interesting is that in included with the album, there's a little uh, like altar music uh, missile, including the uh, the guidelines for his chant setting. So next we look at Ray Rapp, and uh, he was this young man in the 50s and 60s, and he entered uh, Cardinal Glennon College Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, soon after high school. And at this time, folk music was becoming wildly popular, and Rapp brought his guitar to seminary to play his favorite folk songs, including the Kingston Trio. So here's the, the Kingston Trio, and they have their two guitars and their banjo, or they like to say, their two citharas and <laughs> one saltiri. <laughs> so yeah, it, you know, before, before like, um, kind of the, the psychedelic music of the 60s, you had this really, in, in America, you had all this like folk music that was, you know, hanging down your head, Tom Dooley, and, and uh, everything like that, so. Now, uh, Ray Rapp, uh, he, in, oh yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I oh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, you know, when you're thinking about the, 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 oh, the, uh, the math, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm looking at
in Ray Rock's second album, he included a banjo of all things on his album. For a first time, it's not even a joke. So let's talk a little bit more about Mr. Rep. Uh, his study of the Psalms at seminary it inspired him to think about how uh, the Psalms could be sung in a folk music style. Now, in the summer of 1965, Rupp attended uh, an orientation set session in Chicago uh, that was designed to send Catholic young people out to work with the poor. And uh, the first mass of the day was, uh, the first mass on the first day was done without music, but on the second day, uh, Rupp obtained permission from the priest to play his guitar for mass. And he played and sang his composition. Soon the entire congregation was singing along. And Rupp gave his copies of uh, his songs to those being sent out on missionary work across the country. So in this way, Rupp's songs were quickly spread to the entire United States. Uh, now, uh, Fitzpatrick and Rupp uh, coordinated. Uh, because of the uh, growing popularity of Rupp's music, uh, Fitzpatrick actually telephoned Rupp and encouraged him to record an album with the Friends of the English Liturgy. Uh, the album was called Mastering Americans. Uh, and it revolutionized the Mass in English, influencing, influencing it for decades to come. And that, it looks like, uh, yeah, this is the Mass for you, America. What you think it was? And, uh, yes. And after Rep's Folk Mass became uh, popular, Fitzpatrick totally abandoned his work on the English liturgy, and Fitzpatrick then created the company FEL Publications Limited, uh, that published many popular hymns in the folk style, including uh, very familiar ones like the Know We Are Christians by Our Love and other ones. Uh, Rep, he came to be known as the father of the guitar mass. Although we no longer hear Rep's music, uh, folk music exactly in mass today, much of the music that is used in the Novus Order liturgy comes from this new musical tradition started by Ray Rep, the father of the guitar mass. So, uh, to gain insight into Rep's ideas about sacred music or music used at, at Mass, uh, we can read the back cover of his Mastering Americans. The question of the use of folk music during the celebration of the liturgy has caused quite a furor. There was, this is a big debate in the 60s. Uh, and it is a question that is generally answered with extreme opinions. Folk type music has been banned in some dioceses and found acceptance in others. Is folk music worthy of the house of God? The composer states his case in these words. Just as we have many types of people with various backgrounds and tastes, we should have various types of music. But the thing with this is that, yes, we got, we got a, more, a little bit more variety within the 60s, but we lost Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. That's not variety. We need, we, need the, we need true variety then, through which these people can express themselves in a meaningful way. Which is worthy, what is worthy of the people of God must surely be worthy of the house of God. This is a point which is not often taken into consideration. Folk type music is usually damned because it is just that, folk music, rather than on its merits as good or bad music, surely the listener will be moved. Wait a second. But what were we talking about with sacred versus profane? Sacred, prof sacred versus the profane is not the distinction between good and bad music, and it's not about being moved by the music. It's, it's that uh, it's what is specifically set apart for worship, what is sacred music. So uh, by the variety of the depth of Mr. Rupp's music, from the energy and rhythmic sweep of the mass, to the lonely but confident commitment so common in our time expressed in the song, I Am Not Afraid. Certainly one of the reasons for the popularity and wide acceptance. So you see, you see this music is now popular music, it's not set apart. As a, uh, Mr. Ruff's music, especially among young people, again, is popular music. That is, the language is a language of the people. The text, also by Mr. Ruff, expressed in a manner just as simple and as meaningful as the music of the soul of the modern psalmist. May I also point out, a lot of this is, the lyrics are written by Ruff. They're not uh, actually, a lot of it is not actually scripture, whereas traditional music is uh, presenting scripture. And later it goes on to say, we think that the listener will find this album an expression of the youthful, vigorous, religious feeling. Again, it's a popular feeling at the time. So, now uh, let's move on to today and let's talk about traditional Catholic music today. Now, there are growing efforts to bring traditional Catholic music back into Catholic worship. 
uh, and, and composers are even creating new chants and new polyphonic works based upon what has come before. But how aren't just Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony, are they just relics of the Middle Ages? What value could they possibly have for modern people? Well, to finish out my talk here, I want to illustrate the deep value that Gregorian chant and these other forms of traditional music can have for the human soul. Uh, I'm about to read a few comments that this is on a YouTube video. This is a little bit non-scientific, but this is from a YouTube video of the Salve Regina chant uh, posted by the Dominican Friars of the House of Studies in uh, Washington, D.C., and they sing the traditional Salve Regina Dominican chant um, every night for a Compline night, uh, night prayer. And so it just, there's just a wide range of people who say here. So a Muslim here, but there's something about these beautiful heavenly voices that touch my soul. Indeed, this represents the true image of God, so powerful and magnificent. I'm Orthodox Christian, but I got goosebumps while I listen to this chant. Like Holy Spirit is about to enter inside of me. Respect from the Orthodox Church of Serbia. Deus falls, Ave Christus Rex. I'm Anglican, but if I was brought up in Portugal, I could easily be Catholic with this Mary and him. I become deeply moved with love for the Mother of God, reading from your separated brethren. God bless you and keep you. Amen. I'm converting from Protestant to Catholic. This is such a blessing. God put a new song in my mouth. I fell in love with the Sali Regina. By the way, I'm Hindu by religion, but I love this chant. I've been struggling with dryness and desolation. My spiritual life feels like it's about to fall apart, and it's so stressful and exhausting holding it all together. Listening to these Gregorian chants and meditating on Jesus gives me such peace in this difficult time. They allow me to sleep after so many sleepless nights. Thank you, Lord. I'm an atheist, but church choirs are truly magnificent. Now, just to give a little bit of comparison, here's a comment on uh, Ray Rupp's <laughs> Alulu. This, this comes from his, uh, his, this album where he included the banjo back in the <laughs> album. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, it's not, it's not bad music. It just uh, depends on what it should be used in the liturgy. It's, it's actually, you know, rest music is, is a lot of fun. But, okay, so, so uh, this, this viewer of this video says this. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this music from the 60s. I remember well singing in the youth choir at Ramey Air Force Base in Puerto Rico. It was a great way for a young person at that period of time to connect to the Holy Mass. Now I find myself enjoying the Latin Mass more. We change as we grow. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> over 2,000 year history, the Catholic Church developed a beautiful tradition of sacred music. Gregorian chant and polyphony, they are enhanced prayer, and they exist side by side uh, as prayer, uh, as means of elevating prayer that can transcend issues of good versus bad, popular versus unpopular, entertaining versus boring, what I like or what I do not like. Chanted polyphony, they are not musical performances. Rather, they proclaim sacred scripture, and they are the sacred musical forms, not profane. Jesus Christ and his church made them sacred. They are still the official music of the Catholic Church. And therefore, we must work to restore this musical tradition to its proper place in the liturgy and preserve it for future generations. And so here are my uh, sources. And I'd like to thank the members of uh, the Roy School. <laughs> Thank you very much, and as we would chat, Hax to homi sit semper bohobi school, or may the peace of the Lord be always with you.